So this um, presentation is a, a continuation of work that we've been doing for the last couple of years. Um, it, it started off as a project to try and develop a better understanding of evaporation losses from, from storage tanks and to try and identify some opportunities to improve the existing uh, algorithms that API has and, and US EPA has, has put into their tanks model for estimating evaporation losses from storage tanks. So what we did in the beginning was start off with as simple a system as we could. We looked at an underground storage tank at a retail, or a retail service station that had um, gasoline in it. So this was a tank that was uh, instrumented to measure both the, the temperature of the product in the tank, the, the liquid level in the tank, and then we put a continuous monitoring system on that tank to, uh, to measure the emissions from that, that source and um, then compare the measurement results to, to what the API algorithms would, would predict for those particular cases. So the, the overall objective was really to determine, sorry, to develop improved methods for measuring and, and estimating emissions from petroleum storage tanks. And this is where we're ultimately working towards. And, and one of the, the weaknesses in the existing API algorithms is that if you read the documentation on them, they're uh, recommended for use in developing emission inventories for assessing annual average emissions, but uh, not for designing vapor control systems and not for determining instantaneous emission rates, which if you're doing an air quality assessment, you're trying to predict impacts on receptors, you need to understand what the the peak emissions will be and, and what the, the variability in those emissions would be. And so that was part of what we were trying to do as well, was to develop a, a better way of trying to assess those um, aspects of the emissions coming off, off of storage tanks. Um, and I guess some of the rationale behind this is the, um, the existing methods are, are recognized in the literature as, as tending to underestimate average emissions. Um, there's a need for estimating, as I mentioned, instantaneous emissions. And uh, there's a, well, in, in Alberta at least, we, we anticipate future growth of the oil sand sector and, and clearly, um, a lot of the pipeline systems are being expanded as more storage tanks going into place. A lot of the products that are being handled have higher reduced sulfur compound content, so there's, there's a lot more interest in these, as well as things like benzene and, and uh, VTEX emissions in general and other potentially toxic compounds that could be coming off these tanks. So having a better way of, of estimating these emissions and providing better accuracy, is, as well as being able to feed into the design of vapor control systems for these types of tanks is, is a useful thing. Uh, the collaborators for this project are Carleton University. Uh, Matt Johnson has, has worked closely with us on this work. He's co-authored the, the current project reports that, uh, that exist for the study. And uh, he's been working in parallel, developing um, instrumentation that could be used to, to help measure some of these emissions um, more economically than the systems that we've been using to, to do this particular study. Uh, we've had funding from the APERF program and uh, NRCAN PERT funding. And of course, industry has been kind enough to offer up facilities for us to, to install our systems and do this monitoring. So the retail service station that we have in, in Calgary here, uh, the system went into that in uh, January of 2012, and it's been running virtually continuously since that time. Um, so we've got over a year's worth of, of data on the system, which has allowed us to, to see some of the variations in seasonal effects and uh, certainly diurnal effects. The, uh, the achievements that we have to date, we've developed a, a refinement of the system that we initially put on the, the underground storage tank at the retail service station to uh, overcome some of the, the instrumentation issues that we had with that system and uh, provide a more robust and, and, and easier to poll and, and monitor panel and uh, array of sensors that we are now installing on an above ground storage tank. The, the above ground storage tank is actually going in at a, a bulk fuels facility where we have the same kinds of uh, benefits. There's a, a beta root uh, liquid level monitoring system on that particular tank just like there was on the underground storage tank. They continuously measure both the liquid level and the, the product temperature in the tank so we can correct for uh, thermal expansion and contraction of the fluid in the tank. And it's a, a tank that has, in this case, two, particular, two vents on it, so we're instrumenting both of the vents to continuously monitor what's happening on that, that particular tank. Um, and then we've developed algorithms based on the data that we had from the underground tank to predict what we were seeing from the tank in terms of emissions, and we've 
compared that to um, what the API correlations would estimate, and, and I'll go through that a little bit here um, in terms of what we think is happening and, and what our model considers and, and how that compares. So the, <coughs> the average areas, uh, or sorry, the average errors that uh, we've seen in the API model have been reduced from 50 to 60 percent to less than 10 percent for underground storage tanks. Uh, if anything, we tend to overestimate the amount of emissions from underground tanks now, whereas the API model was was basically predicting half of what we were measuring coming off of these tanks. Um, the, the vent emission monitoring system that we, we put on the underground tank and, and essentially the same capabilities are there on the, the above ground tank. Uh, the objective was to continuously quantify or monitor the emissions coming off these tanks and, and provide as good accuracy as we could. So we're able to, with the, the ultrasonic flow meter, get down to uh, vent gas flow rates of about 0.1 meters per second or better. Um, the underground tank is, is being, the panel for this is being monitored, powered using a solar panel. Uh, but the above ground tank, we're going to use actual site power to, uh, to power that. Um, we've used clamp on ultrasonic flow meters on the underground tank, and uh, on the above ground tank, we're going to use a flow cell similar to the ones that you saw on the top of the storage tanks and for the casing gas venting by wetting the transmitters to the, the flow, we, we get a bit better um, response in the signals that we come off, or that, that come off those transmitters. So we're doing that on the, on the current tank. Um, and, and in both cases, there's really no flow disturbance in the, the piping. We're not changing um, or putting any back pressure on these tanks. We're, we're trying to keep everything as, as original as it was. Um, we have put our own bent pipes on the tanks and, and removed the existing ones that were there, but the bent pipes are essentially um, same diameter, similar lengths. Um, so the flow conditions that have, we've gone out of our way to make sure we don't affect the flow conditions in these tanks or artificially impact what's, what's happening in the tanks. And then the, the data logging capabilities, um, both these panels uh, are remotely accessible, so we, we have the data sent back to our office uh, using cellular communications. And uh, we have diagnostic systems that, that monitor the data coming in and, and check for faulty instruments and, and problems with the, the system. And we're, we're polling the devices currently at a rate of uh, once every six seconds, so we have a fairly large data set over the course of the time that we've been monitoring these particular tanks. And when we designed it, of course, we had to comply with the hazardous location requirements for putting um, equipment around storage tanks. So that was all done to, to meet the requirements of the operators at these sites. This diagram quickly shows you, um, I guess, the key components of the system. So the underground storage tank site had, of course, tanks for the different products that were being handled, and each of them had a dedicated vent stack. Uh, we put our monitoring system in there and uh, communicated wirelessly with a laptop which was at the site and the laptop was connected to the beta root uh, monitoring system on the underground tank so it would uh, extract data from the beta root system and it would take the, the monitoring results from the control panel and it would send that back wirelessly to our office where we would, uh, would then archive it and, and analyze it. Uh, this is what the, the underground system looks like. It's the, um, this is the solar panel of course. The, the pipe in this particular case is a little bit taller than the rest, is the one that has our sensors on it. We made it a little bit taller partly to um, allow us to, to rotate that pipe without interfering with the other pipes once we had our sensors mounted on it. But as well, um, at the last minute we wound up having to change the site we were going to install this and uh, the, the bed heights were a little bit different at this site than they were at the one we were originally looking at. But we didn't see any issue with that uh, difference in heights. It's just a, a view of the uh, solar panel, or sorry, the, the, the monitoring panel that we had put in place, the, the, uh, the gray box that you see there. And then this is just uh, some of the sensors that are on the, the pipe. So these top ones are the, the clamp-on ultrasonic flow meter sensors or transducers. Uh, just below that is a, a thermocouple. And uh, just get a glimpse of it, but there's also um, an oxygen sensor and a, a total hydrocarbon sensor that are wetted to the, the gas flow there and, and, and monitor those parameters as well. So the actual configuration of everything at the site, this is pretty close to what the site actually looked like. Um, the, the tanks themselves, 
have vent lines that run to the vent stacks. They also have uh, liquid lines that have a check valve at the bottom of them and, and are full of liquid that run to the, the dispensers at the site. And uh, the only, so the only open part of the system really is just at the vent line here. Uh, the, the fill ports on the, the tanks are normally closed uh, during normal operation and they're only opened up briefly when, when the tank truck comes to the site and connects. The, uh, the API algorithms for estimating these emissions, they would calculate emissions um, based on the standing losses and the working losses from, from the tank. Um, for an underground storage tank, they recommend assuming that you have uh, zero standing losses because the ground is at a relatively constant temperature, so you don't get the diurnal temperature changes that you would see on an above ground tank. And, and their thinking then was that, of course, you would have zero emissions from, from the tank. Um, the, the working losses, are related to the degree of uh, vapor concentration in the vapor space of the tank and the physical displacement of that, that air vapor mixture during filling events. So the assumption is that the, the air that comes into the tank comes into equilibrium with the, um, the product that's in the tank, or at least it comes to some percentage of, of equilibrium conditions, and they, uh, they actually provide factors for accounting or the degree of saturation that you actually achieve, and that's related to the, the number of turnovers on the tank. Um, they also have a, a correction factor that they apply based on the, the type of product that you're handling. So it would be one for refined products and uh, 0 0.75 for crude oils. And they, they really don't explain why it would be less for crude oils and, and what the thinking behind that was. But it didn't really make any difference for what we were doing because we were using gasoline. Um, Inherent in the, the EPA or the API algorithms is a, an assumption that you've got some degree of stratification taking place in the tank. So when, when you pull the air in, um, you would have essentially fresh air at the top of the tank towards the vent and you would have a richer mixture of, of air vapor um, towards the, the surface of the, the liquid that's in the tank and, and as the tank fills, and, and you get towards the top of your fill cycle, you would start to displace the emissions and it would be some, again, percentage of what the saturation level would be for that total mixture. Um, what we found was that that wasn't the case. Uh, we've actually seen this in above ground tanks and below ground tanks that when you uh, have a liquid that's warm relative to the ambient air, then when the ambient air comes in and contacts the liquid surface, it will warm up and, uh, and of course, expand. And, and that causes vapor growth in the tank, and that causes some mixing to take place. And, and you tend to get well-mixed conditions. And if you've got a product that's cold relative to the ambient air, then it would tend to promote the stratification because you would have uh, a cold layer towards the surface of that liquid, which would be denser than the, the air above it, which would be warmer, and, and it just naturally stratifies. And which is typical, I think, of a lot of conditions in the United States in the lower 48, anyhow. Um, but what we found was if you try to do a mass balance on this system, their assumption is that you somehow come to this equilibrium condition without causing any emissions, and the emissions only occur when you displace that, that equilibrium mixture from the tank during a filling event. Uh, what, if you try to do a mass balance, actually happens is if you draw fresh air into the tank and you start to promote uh, product evaporation, then for every molecule of product that evaporates, you have to physically displace a molecule of air vapor mixture from the tank. If it's a stratified condition in the tank, then you're probably displacing an air molecule from the tank, which doesn't matter. But if it's a well-mixed environment in the tank, then you're probably displacing a, a, a molecule that is partly gas and, and and on average, and, and partly um, air. And so because we were seeing what appeared to be well-mixed conditions in the tank, we, we assumed that that was always the case, that we had full stratification, full saturation in the vapor space and, and did our mass balance. And you can come up with an equation when you solve that that um, allows you to then predict what the evaporation losses would be as a function of the activity on the tank. So we did that, and we compared that to what we measured and, and what the API uh, algorithms would predict. And rather than actually show you this table, which is in the presentation and shows the day-by-day -day numbers, I'll, I'll just skip to the next one, which shows um, what we saw as a function of season for the tank. So the first year that we did this, we 
didn't actually get the system running until uh, the beginning of March, so we had about 28 days in, in March where we had data that we could analyze, and, and what we saw when we did that was that the, um, the API algorithms um, estimated for the time period uh, 210 kilograms of product evaporated from the tank, where when we looked at what we were measuring off the tank based on the, the vapor content and, and flow rate from that tank, uh, we were seeing 451 kilograms of product being emitted. So the, the API number was, was low by roughly a factor of two. Um, when we took our modified algorithm, we estimated the working losses using the same approach that we would have used for the API algorithm, although we didn't uh, apply this um, factor that they had for uh, the amount of activity in the tank. We assumed that it was fully saturated, so we came up with a slightly different number. But we also uh, added in this contribution that results because you've got fresh air coming in that's promoting vapor growth within the tank. And, and when we added our algorithm in there, it brought the total up to 564 kilograms. So we overstated the emissions by 25%, uh, but um, overall we came closer to what the actual number was than, than what API did. And, and we were at least conservative in doing that. The data that came out of the, the rest of the monitoring that took place, um, the, we had continuous monitoring throughout the spring of 2011. We had some problems with some of the sensors and with the panel in uh, the summer period, and then that got resolved in the fall. And, and then we started to get better data again into 2012. So based on, on those data sets that we've got, uh, we actually wound up getting much better results because we had larger data sets and on average things seemed to work out with quite a bit better. So now instead of being high by a factor of 25%, we're high by only 6%. And, and if you average the weighted results for the entire uh, available time series, um, you, you wind up with a, an overestimate of about 9.1%, which is still, considering what it is we're trying to do and how we're trying to estimate it, it's still a pretty good number. So we're, uh, we're now trying to determine whether this happens or not on, on above ground tanks and to what extent it happens. And um, we're doing that. So we're doing that at a bulk station. Um, that system is, we're just on the verge of implementing that system now. The panel's been built, the sensors are in our possession. Um, we're just completing the, the drawings and design details for uh, the host facility that's approving this to go in on their system. So we will be monitoring the tank through the remainder of this year and the first quarter of next year and the results from this next set of monitoring uh, would become available March 31st, uh, 2013. This is just a slide showing what the, um, the bulk facility that we're actually putting this in looks like. Um, these are two diesel tanks, these are two gasoline tanks, one's dyed and, and one's uh, undyed gasoline. And this is the tank that we're actually going to put the, uh, the monitoring system on. So it's got two two-inch vent stacks on, on the tank. And there's just a simple schematic showing the types of sensors and equipment that we're putting on the tank. And uh, they'll all be hardwired to our monitoring panel, which will then send the information back. And, and the thing that we're going to do here that will be different than what we've done at the other sites is we're also putting in uh, a, a full vet station um, so that we can monitor wind speed and direction and uh, barometric pressure and relative humidity and, and bring that into trying to understand what we're seeing in the tank and how that might be affecting the, the emissions that we're seeing. Thank you.